Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. In today's episode, Travis and I talk with Jason and Adarian from Colorado. We talk a bit about Hearthkin Salvagers, as well as Hyrotech Circle, and of course there's going to be a little bit of Phobos that sneaks in here as well. Stay tuned for the conversation. True. We've got all the Jasons. It's not even the first time we've had multiple Jasons on here, if I remember correctly. You know, for any listeners who are just tuning in right now, Jason is just coming off of the high of beating Micromancer, one of Command Point's, you know, big, big names in the Command Point Discord, as far as TTS tournaments go. Yes, I played my Phobos versus his Blooded, and it was bonkers. Yeah, for the, so for our two Colorado guests, you know, Jason here just, just took down Blooded on a TTS league, playing LVO maps, if I remember correctly. It was, it was uh, the LVO map 7. Yeah, and you were just doinking him from, you know, every which way he's, hiding inside his deployment behind a heavy wall trying not to get killed and you were just absolutely demolishing him yeah so real quick if you want to hang with horde teams playing elites plan for overwatch (laughs) yeah yeah uh (laughs) you guys say it so obviously even though the the whole entire meta is like ah elites are bad because we just can't do enough and jason's out here like you know i'll just get shot and then if you don't kill me or after you shoot your plasma someone else is going to overwatch and kill you I mean, three shots a turn from each model. Can't be mad about that. You're right. You're right. It's so straightforward, five head. To be fair, you know, Jason has been crushing it. At LVO, he went five, two, and two. And, you know, just now (laughs) I watched a little bit of a clip of his incursors just sniping out a poor blooded team. I think you were messaged me and you said in turn one, you got five blooded for one incursor. Yeah. So it was basically, I mean, bait out the plasma and then just start butchering everyone. Uh, really just turn the aggression up to 11 and that pretty much is the whole plan there so anyways we've got a darian and we've got jason from colorado today jumping in and joining the conversation a darian you want to give a little spiel about which team you'll be talking about today so i've been playing a lot of hearthkin salvagers recently um Mm -hmm. i see a lot of i'm a very aggressive dwarf player a good a good dwarf is a dead dwarf got to get those grudge tokens out if right. if I have a dwarf that's alive doing nothing, it's useless. He's better off dead. All right. And then Jason, where do you what are we uh coming to you to talk about today? Uh well, I, I love me some good spooky boys. Uh I play the uh Necrons. I've actually been playing Necrons in Warhammer 40,000 since third edition, so had to play them in uh Kill Team as well. All right, all right, cool. Cuz I do think both of these teams are off meta teams and there's probably a fair amount to talk about, right? I think they are. Yeah, I think I think I think higher tech are, are primed to podium at some event somewhere. I think mm. they're on the, on the up and up. Yeah, I mean, from, you know, conversations with other competitive players, I know Australia's got a pl- big player who's interested in playing them. And I know command points Shane, He's been on here like twice and both times he was on here. He could not help but talk about higher tech circle for a fair number of the podcast so i do think that there's definitely some juice in there and i after writing the article for goonhammer i i also kind of want to play them (laughs) they're a fun team to play i mean they are really tough uh you know if you're chipping damage into them and you're not killing the operatives and then you just leave them alone they just come back and heal right back up again and even when you think you've knocked them down they'll just get right back up again yeah the the worst the worst part of that team, it's a temporal nanomine. That thing is garbage. However, just walk through it. Don't be afraid. I mean, if you're a dwarf, it. you can't go any slower than you're already going. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, like, I play clowns. Clowns just walk through it. Just don't be afraid of it. It's there to, to spook yeah. you away. Yeah, you know, it, kind of people like are... 
I was gonna say people are afraid of it. Uh, you know, you drop it down, it's got a six inch aura. So, you know, on some map layouts, it can cover literally half the table. Uh, and people go like, oh, I can't charge through. I can't move through. I'm like, like Adarian said, just move through it. It's going to slow you down, but just move through it. Yeah. And you could probably plan out your routes with it in mind, right? Like there are some maps where as long as there's enough cover on the way up, you can still at least be in cover. It doesn't have to be that you don't move. It just means that you're moving four inches, you're shooting, and then you're patting, like you're standing in the bubble. But if you're trying to move dash, then it's probably not worth your time. (laughs) So it sounds like the Colorado scene still has an elite meta. Is that is that what I'm hearing? A lot of legionary, Nurgle legionary. Okay, so we're we're still we're still like in the six months ago meta. hundred percent. Everyone's just incredibly tough, super annoying, and the orcs have not come come home and taken everyone's lunch. We do have a couple oh. of orc players, and they're still like, nope. I, we'll just take the loss against the commandos. It's fine. We just want the advantage against some of the other teams. I'll say the meta might be changing though. Cause we were just looking at the, the breakdown of teams for our league that is starting here uh, tomorrow. Actually, we've got 26 players in it. And uh, I think there's four commando players. We've, we, but we still have like three Phobos players. Um, so they're, they're still a good mix, but the commandos are on the rise. Well, local meta right now is, a lot of elves. We have a lot of people shifting towards elves of all varieties. Corsair, Corsair Board Scarred. Well, BOK is very popular right now. Uh, I made Harlequins very popular, and a couple other people have, are moving them, uh, trying them out, excuse me. So a lot of more mo- maneuverability, ten, uh, eight, eight to ten man teams, uh, which is giving some issues to the or shockingly the phobos players because they want to have more control but elves are everywhere elves have fly elves just do what elves they want have, elves have power swords they two shot any of your phobos operatives exactly i am not looking forward to the eight eight uh howling banshee list right now with my because uh, i'm playing phobos in the league nice i mean i love i love the blades of cane team I just squeaked out a game on Beta Decima's worst map, I think map six, where I sacrificed a bunch of operatives just to get to the midboard, take some objectives, and then just stall a, an opposing crew team by just standing around just because I have three APL. And the three APL standing on a point just meant he could never loot any of the points away outside of poaching, and I just made sure that he ran out of CP early on. Yeah, five but, and yeah. six are rough yeah. for Beta Decima. I think five and six is just like takes away the ability for any interesting gameplay to happen because you're just everyone is just blitzing down the the lane to get to the objectives which is not not really the most fun i think and there's enough ways to not have cover when you're making those runs up where your opponent can sit a base over a ledge and take a shot down the lane to strip your barricade so not really doing much unless you know maybe you're playing a little hearth and salvagers oh i do that every time in beta decima Give me that fortify on that barricade. Give me make that heavy. I yeah, having played against John or can you roll a crits hearth can salvagers at the world championships, that matchup with Pathfinders felt incredibly annoying just because I can't strip anything because there's so much heavy on the midboard and then all of his deployment was heavy. It's just like this sucks. Yeah, and you need so many marker lights to even get through all the obscuring rules, so Okay, he he has a rotary cannon. He doesn't need marker lights. He gets to shoot first. Yeah, you've got one dude who can do it, but because everything is heavy on their side, they just yeah. post up, wait for you to go play the objective, and then doink you. So maybe that's a good segue into our operative showdown this week because Hearthkin are just, they're just definitely one of the most complicated teams, I think, in the game right now. Operative showdown. That's right, friends. It is time for the operative showdown. Friends, jump on in and tell me about which of these Hearthkin Salvager operatives are treating you best. Honestly, MVP is always the Jump Pack Warrior. Uh, seven inch movements with Fly, eight inch charge with Brutal, five five melee profile. He 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 launches forward. He gets me secure vantage because you always seek recon with those guys. Because hey, how do I? I can't hold all these climbing ropes. I get to take with the lugger, right? 
Uh, and he's got a 13 inch normal move too, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he has the boost for two yeah. AP. Uh, otherwise, the the locketer with the early detection. You want to move forward? No, stay in your deployment zone. We're playing at my speed today. You you want to great against Chaos Holt? That's how I deal with Chaos Holt. Like they have the equipment to let them dash forward. Mm-hmm. Just stop them from even taking that. Uh, I honestly take. The Kinlink, the Cognitar, and the Locketer, because the the Cognitar lets me delay in the strategic phase before using any uh, command points, just dropping down an attack or defense token. Uh, the the Kinlink giving plus one APL or making someone activate last is huge. It just there's so much utility on this team, outside of the Gunners, that I think the Gunners kind of steal the spotlight away from really interesting models and really interesting design choices you have to make during the game. Punish people that try to be greedy on turn uh, at the end of turning point one to get the initiative on turn point two. Oh, they put an operative hanging out there, lock it down. He's now moving last. Ignore him for the entire turning point. Uh, the the utility grenade from the Grenadier, I, I actually underutilized that. Uh, a mini uh, temporal nanomine uh, a range reduction on 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 guns and the ability to make a mission actions cost one more. Yeah, he has a he has a big dynamite stick. I I preferred playing him with the control uh, utility grenade. Uh, the the her, grenadier has a utility grenade that you place within six inches of him, and if they're within three inches of that utility grenade token, uh, they must. Uh, one additional action point must be subtracted for them to perform mission actions and the pickup action. Mm, like terror. Like terror. Ooh, this is like some secret tech I haven't really heard people talk about. Tell us more. That that grenade, you have to choose one of three profiles. One of them is like a mini temporal nanomine. Uh, one of them just goes, oh, you have a sniper up on that sniper nest? Well, now his range is only six inches. Mm. What are you going to do with him? Are you just going to keep him up there? Oh, you're going to... You're going to put that Incursor Marksman up on Conceal and wait for someone to come around? I'm going to throw a grenade on him. Now he's never going to be able to shoot anybody. And now that he's concealed, he loses his Overwatch opportunity. Double negative. Also, the the thing that I keep forgetting about the Grenadier is the 4-plus feel-no-pain that he has. Against against, Blast. Against Blast, Splash, Torrent, and Mines. Just, Just run him into the Incursor Mine. Okay, I'll take half as half as much damage. I'm still going to be there. I have eight wounds. Now you'd lost your mind for the game. It's no longer scary. Yeah, I mean, the utility on the team is huge. Just because you are playing at such a deficit as far as movement goes. You know, we've had Ace here on the past talk about taking a bunch of plasma knives as a way to fix some of the deficiencies on the operatives. Well, at the New York Open, we had a player take a lot of ramparts and fortifies so that he could set up a mid-ground defensive line where he could move up safely and then ignore his own barricades and jump people at asymmetric ranges, effectively. Because to get up and shoot, people were too far away, but for him to come out and shoot was very easy. So between those two strategies, do you find that you play one of them more than the other, or are you using your operatives kind of as a mix between the two? Because when I saw them played at the World Championship with Can You Roll a Crit, he was definitely playing a lot more of the barricade play compared to the, the knife play. I, like I said earlier, a good dwarf is a dead dwarf. I, tur- every turning point, you know, two on, I'm popping a proximate, uh, yeah, proximate firepower to give me the plus one ballistic skill. I'm going to be six inches away from you. I'm not good in melee, but you're going to be out in the open if you charge me, and I'm going to have a benefit for shooting you. And now that I'm hitting on threes instead of fours, which is the honestly the weakest part of the team, they hit on fours. Hitting on threes now, letting me use grudge tokens to get you know a hit and a, a crit and two hits, two crits and a hit, makes it so that these the gunners because AP two two AP two guns. Are going to kill somebody at a sacrifice of oh my lugger that already did a job by running up 
grabbing the objective and giving out climbing ropes to everybody during the uh, equipment phase. He's done his job. He can die, give me a grudge token, get somebody in the open, a key player, especially great against elites. And now, oh, the, the legionary is now dead because he decided to get too close to that lugger and try to kill him. It does kind of remind me of how Jason ran, <laughs> describes his LVO games, where he sends five assault intercessors out to go do things and force people out of hiding. And then he just mm -hmm. has one guy with a gun in the back, just reaching out and touching people. Yes. And you have three guys with guns. You got three gunners, two of them with AP2, one of them right. with six dice. So, Darian, with... do you do you find like one of your Hearthkin salvagers tends to overperform or do all three gunners kind of put in equal amounts of work or is it really like the ap2 gun is picking up a lot of a lot of kills throughout the course of a game uh the magna rail rifle because the ancestors are watching it's no longer unwieldy at that point move dash ap2 mortal wounds three you you're 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 bonking somebody out of the game uh when i was against shooty teams i kind of i sometimes take the field medic it's a three five lethal fight plus plasma knife. It is Get a grudge and, token, stab somebody. And really when you're getting shot at, the medics do a lot of work as being another comms model effectively, because you're getting back an APL that your opponent isn't expecting. If you can bait it out correctly or you set up the positional play for the medic. And that's really where medics are useful in shooting matchups. And Sometimes you see the medic next to the target. The medic is on conceal. The third, what they want to see a shoot is on engage, but the medic's there, so they don't take the shot because oh, he's just going to live anyway. So they're going to make suboptimal plays. It's the game. The game's all about action point economy. Make sure that your actions are more impactful than theirs. I was just. Uh, I'm actually just curious. You know, Colorado Jason, have you had to play against Adarians? Hearthkin, how's how's the experience been? Like, which operatives do you feel like he uses better than you would have expected? Uh, yeah, we actually just played a game on Beta Decima. Uh, Beta Decima six. My, yeah, it was Beta Decima six. My higher tech versus his Hearthkin. Uh, I will say I made a mistake. I forgot that they had that uh, loc locator, locator, whatever he's called, and decided to bring a death mark. Uh, which was a mistake because I can't use dimensional concealment with that operative uh, on his uh, when he deploys him. Um, yeah, a lot of what he says is true. I mean, being able to go out there and fortify a barricade with heavy cover on Beta Decima on one of those two side lanes is huge because he can just run up there and hide, and you can't you can't take them out with unless you get close enough to take them out. Um, cause you ignore vantage is going to ignore, uh, or, or sorry, heavy, uh, doesn't let you, uh, ignore the, the conceal from vantage. Um, but in some ways my higher tech doesn't really care about that because they do their best work when they're six inches away because of one of their strats that allows them to a free reroll on their attacks. And so I just get up in his face and, you know, either Tesla or gauze in his face to take him out. Um, but I would say a lot of what he was saying about baiting out my guys. Yeah. You have to go on engage to shoot and now he's got targets to shoot back and he's putting grudge tokens on you because you're killing his operatives. Um, and then it just makes him so much easier to, to kill my operatives. So. Yeah. And all the Don gunners pretty much, except for some of the, you know, the medic and the uh, jump pack guy have the P one weapon. That's basically a P one with grudge tokens there. So. Hmm. Yeah, and there's something to be said for taking uh, weapons that do crits against elites, especially when they have high armor saves. Because, yeah, you have three dice on a three-up armor save as a space marine, but if you can proc more crits in your attacks against uh, an elite with a good armor save, you're going to get more damage through, because now they have to roll a crit save in order to save that. Or yeah, you have I mean, to defend against a six-die rotary cannon, too. That gets damage through all the time. Yeah. Big dice count equals kills everyone, including elites. Exactly. Yeah, I've played some Phobos, and one of my favorite uh, kit outs with the uh, veteran is uh, the Lethal 5 Up and Rending. Yeah, Lethal 5 Up Rending with P1, with P1, of course, during the Deadly Shots turn, so you're really just ripping through. Uh, it's, it's just what we talked about. You're able to, you're getting more consistent crits because now you're getting a third of your uh, hits or should be crits, and then you're able to get a second crit through. It just makes it so much harder for those, uh, any operative. Uh, especially those those elites with those three three up saves 
uh, or even uh, I would say like clowns with their four up invulnerable to actually save those because now they have to save an, a crit just makes it so much easier to get damage through. If a Harlequin can manage to get a melt a gun in and kill you while out activating, then they might get a second kill. But I guess in Jason's world, everyone's on engage anyways. So you shoot him, you kill him, and then he just pops Angel Death and fires back. I mean, the game is called Kill Team. Yeah, I mean, everyone else is playing points team, but Elite's players are definitely playing Kill Team because uh, you can't hang with the big dogs if you're not just like out killing enormously. This is this is also how, you know, the best placing intercession player at the World Championship talked about playing intercession squad at the World Championships, where basically he's playing kill team and not points team, because you really can't play the points game because everyone else is out activating you. So you really got to make your stat block someone else's problem, which, you know, sounds like it is still working. Yeah, if you want to hear more about that, that's the episode with Julio and Sawyer. Um, sometime in season one, you can jump back. It was like episode 30 something. Um, take a listen to that if you're if something you're interested in. You know, when it comes to, so, you know, we talked a little bit about the higher tech circle and Hearthkin, but swinging back around to the Colorado scene, you know, how many shops are out in Colorado that you two are playing at? Cause it sounds like the pair of you are doing a lot of the organization in Colorado. You want to tell us a little bit about kind of like the grassroots of the scene and how things have been going? Sure. Uh, so we, we kind of got started at there's a hobby town in Aurora, Colpar's Hobby Town. Uh, that's kind of our main uh, meetup place right there. We have a Saturday kill team. Um, but, you know, when we started kind of building a community around kill team, we said we don't want to be just like one store. We want to be not just even the Denver area, but we want to be like uh, the entire Colorado area. Um, so we, we've uh, actually gone to other stores. We we re- ran a tournament in December at Mythic Games. Uh, there's a new store opening up. Uh, is it Lakewood um, called yep. Elysium Games um, that we're looking forward to because we know that that owner. Um, we've also gone up and played games at Total Escape Games. Um, and yeah, players there's, oh, that, several that play at like Wizards Chess. We have six to ten game stores that are that we have a presence in basically right we have some player base 70 plus uh people in our discord now and that's i think great growth because we started this last year april of last year so we're not even a full year old yet no yeah we started it with like a handful of people And we try to do some uh, long distance uh, collaborations. Uh, There's a great group down in uh, Colorado Springs, about an hour and a half south of here, of where the main group is. Uh, Those guys are great. They ran they run a great tournament when we were there last. Uh, They've come up to play in ours. Uh, So we we're just trying to make the game as accessible as possible. Everything's very low stakes. There's no, uh, we don't want any, like, we want people to be competitive, but not spiteful, spitefully competitive here. So, and so far, so good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. honestly, yeah, we haven't had any, any issues in any of the events we've run. We've run what four tournaments now. We try to do one every three months. Uh, well, we've done we've done two tournaments. One, we're starting our second league, um, so we've done three events. Um, yeah, and the, both all those events have been really well received by the community. And there's there's yeah not been any kind of drama. Like uh, Adarian said, it's very low stakes. There are some prizes, but it's you know it's not big cash prizes or anything like that. Um, you know, it's just some trophies and some gift cards. Um, so it's not like people are coming in for, you know, big, uh, big prize packages or things like that. And you get, you know, your super sweaty player or anything like that. And what we focus on is, you know, be the opponent that you want to play against. Um, so, you know, be a good opponent, be a good sportsman, um, you know, play your games, uh, uh, you know, without being sweaty. 
Yeah. Be the example that you want to be. I still remember like the day that I, me and my friend walked into a store and we had two gigantic dudes doink us between a building and blow up all of our, our operatives when we had like just started learning 40k and I'm like, I'm never going to be that person. So I did it on accident one time and I do apologize to that player. He's <laughs> I've had to apologize in person a couple times because I did like yeah. destroy him in my most sweaty moment in Kill Team. But generally I try to be pretty chill and like explain all of the reasonings for making moves i just played against one of our newer players i think on thursday where we played a strike force justian versus custodies and i just made sure that i was teaching him as much as possible and making sure that as he was making moves he's like i can't get shot here right and i was like well i have this sergeant this sniper who can ignore obscurity and i explained all the obscurity rules because really that's probably where you're going to get the most value when someone doesn't bounce off the scene just because it's a very very high friction game as far as like building a new scene definitely Uh, you were you were playing uh strike force justine in that game i was playing justine i was playing justine against uh four custodies just so that because that was i there was a monthly tournament that I went to that I had to skip out on the second round, and that opponent was the person I was supposed to play, but I couldn't I couldn't make it because it was uh, Lunar New Year, basically. So I said I would make it up. We made it up on Thursday, you know, really making sure that he had the full welcoming experience as best I could. And, uh, you know, he set up his custody sergeant behind a box, and he thought that he was in cover, and I was like, well, my on a diagonal map if i'm all the way out on the other side i can definitely draw line of sight and i can definitely ignore obscurity and i can definitely doink you so just move back around thankfully kill team has very little gotchas so it's a very for a skirmish game uh at least in my experience i play uh, i have played a huge gambit of skirmish games uh, the worst gotcha is the novitiate's blinding fa- uh blinding aura in my opinion, uh, but realistically, every it, it is a game of of blinds. Keep your toesies behind cover. Keep your toe tucked yeah. directly in the quarter inch of cover at all times. And how many players are playing out in Colorado right now? It sounds like you've got you two have a couple of shops that you guys are rotating through. Is the player base you know fifteen players, twenty players, thirty players, or we, you know much more than that? What do you guys we have? A sense have been on? maxing out are 16 man tournaments every right. time uh yeah. we have a 26 man league that we started today or tomorrow technically we put up pairings today yeah pairings went up today but yeah technically it starts tomorrow so we yeah i think for for kill team saturday we will have regularly when the weather's good uh six to eight games of kill team going on you know um these are just pickup games, people showing up either to get a game or people are re- prearranging it on the Discord uh, before they show up. Um, and we have a number of game players that play during the week as well, some on, you know, TTS. Uh, using our Discord, showing their screen so everyone can just come in and kibitz and laugh at what's going on. Horrible dice rolls always happen on TTS. Um, uh, we have, but like, we have players that play it like I said, like eight different stores throughout the week. So it's there's always a night that someone's willing to play, which is nice. Yeah, speaking yeah, of bad yeah. dice rolls, I had like a really bad one on Thursday. I had my <laughs> two up plasma pistol captain go out and shoot, and he rolled three ones over two different attacks. And I was like fully out of CP at that point. I was like, oh, he's just going to die. I go into charge the custodian and I roll two hits. I was like, perfect. We love that for me. Yeah. And I just got pasted. <laughs> That sounds like in the last league I was playing Phobos and I was playing into commandos and I sent my, I believe it was my veteran, scrambled him over some uh, scrap piles to take out the uh, squig bomb. And it would have been a twofer because one of his other orcs was within that blast range, Uh, went to go roll and I rolled three ones and a two and a two. (laughs) You know, that was we, one dead Phobos. If anyone has any my plus rending yeah. veteran, if anyone's got any horror stories on dice, you know, pop by our Discord, pop by our YouTube, drop a comment on the episode, and let us know what your worst dice roll was because uh, sounds like we've had a couple bad ones so far in this call. Honestly, I just had a crazy game against my friend Will, 
where his plasma gun jumped out to kill my reaver sergeant. He rolled three ones and killed himself, and Will ended up still winning that game. He still won. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was with uh, those legionaries, so, you know, losing one of his six models to just supercharged plasma suicide. Yikes. Yeah, I will say that same game, though, I made up that bad dice roll. My Phobos commsman shot his grot, and I rolled four sixes. <laughs> Against that, the that grot. Just, Such a high value target. The grot. All right. You know, it sounds like Colorado's doing well. How, you know, what's the growth been like over, because both of you have been playing since the beginning of the edition. Obviously, I suspect that you've been playing kind of and helping to run your tournament scene for a while. How many players have you gotten over the last, you know, two odd years of the game being around? Uh, I mean, like I said, we started the Discord with just a handful of us. Uh, I mean, kind of to, to rewind a little bit. Um, you know, obviously the edition came out towards sort of the tail end of the pandemic, right? So mm-hmm. everybody was on lockdown. Um, you know, I came out of lockdown, uh, looking for a gaming group cause I had just moved to Colorado the, the year before the pandemic in late 2018. Um, and met up with, uh, one of our friends, Michael, and eventually met up with Adarian. And there were three or four of us that were playing and we were trying to, I think, selfishly find other players to play Kill Team against, right? Because if you don't have a community around a game, it just kind of dies. Nobody is playing it and you can't find players. Um, And we eventually decided to start a Discord because trying to get people, we'd go to other stores and trying to get other people to join the specific store's Discord or whatever. They'd be like, oh, I don't go to that store. I don't go to that store. So we were like, let's just start a generic kill team discord for Colorado and let's grow the community that way. And we started that, like I said, in April and we just had maybe a handful of people. And in less than a year, we're up to over 70 people now uh, in, in the discord. And we've seen that increase, not just in people like joining a discord, but active, active participation, you know, showing up and playing games regularly. Like Adarian says, we get people that play on TTS. We get people who play at the different stores. Um, and you know, we get, we went from 16 player league last year to a 26 player league, uh, starting just tomorrow. I feel that's pretty healthy growth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for any of the listeners who are curious to recreate that growth at home, what was your secret ingredient? Uh, I was going to say, I think the secret sauce is engagement. You have to run, you have to do more than just start a Discord or start a forum or start a Facebook page and say, hey, we're out here. I, we play on Friday nights or Saturday nights. You have to have community engagement through organized play of some kind. Uh, but Once you start to get sort of like a critical mass of like eight players, 10 players, start to talk about organizing your first narrative campaign, your first league, your first tournament, um, and, and start to, when you have organized play, then you keep people engaged because now there's a reason to come back every week. It's, it's harder to say, oh, well, I just don't feel like going and playing kill team this weekend. Oh no, I'm going because I'm playing in a league or I'm playing in a narrative campaign. When we ran our first tournament, we, put 16 players as our limit. We thought we would be lucky if we got 10 because we just didn't realize that there were that many kill team players out there. And we ended up adding two more spots because we had people who wanted to play. We ended up with 18 people overall for the first kill team tournament that, you know, we literally advertised it like a month out and we had the tournament was full within a week. There was that much pent up demand for kill team. And once that word got out, then then that's when it really started taking off, because then people were like, hey, these guys are playing kill team and they just run a tournament. And then their friends and their friends and their friends are just it was just word of mouth, I think, at that point. Yeah, the word of mouth is definitely a big thing, like making sure that everyone who comes in has a good time. It's always why I say I like being a dedicated to or having a dedicated to for as much as all the experienced players can just kind of play on autopilot the new players definitely need a little bit more of a a guiding hand or just having someone check in and be like hey is everything okay you know are you like are there any questions because sometimes people don't know to ask questions so making sure that you're there for that really make sure that people have a solid first tournament totally and 
and this is why we are running leagues now too, because we had a lot of new players show up and we told them this was new player friendly and we'd be there to help. Um, but you know, the leagues are great because it's a tournament like format and we run our leagues. Uh, it's basically one round every two weeks. So you basically have your pairing, you have two weeks to organize your game and report it. Um, and then we, then in two weeks we start the next round, which gives, you know, busy adults who have lives and, you know, uh, work and ki kids and family time to get their games in. Um, and we use that as tournament prep for people who've never played in a tournament before, because it gets them into that competitive mindset. It gets them used to having to like, I have to build a roster and I have to think about what operatives I'm going to bring. Um, you know, we even encourage people in the league to play on a clock. Um, so that they get used to playing within a set time frame as well. Um, so the leagues are great tournament prep, um, uh, you, you know, as well. And then, like I said, our kill team Saturday, uh, we run those. We have a lot of new players show up. There's a bunch of us there that have multiple kill teams. And, you know, one of the more experienced people will be like, you know, hey, I'll run a learning game or a daring will be like, hey, I'll run you in a learning game. You don't have anything here use my intercession or do you play 40k just bring your 40k army and we'll build you something out of the compendium and we'll throw a compendium team down on the table and we'll walk you through the game i have run many tactical space marine compendium teams into people for a great learning experience uh the big thing is be friendly be patient uh some of these rules like line of sight aren't intuitive unless you give a like a decent real world real world example uh yeah. game is both easy and hard at the same time so it's it's got a, like a, a low skill floor like you can get in on it pretty easy but then as you start to learn the game uh you realize there's a lot of different interactions even just within the core rules and sometimes it can take a while for a player to click and and get into that mindset yeah i think and when a lot I... of times oh go ahead I was going to say, I think a lot of times when we get a new player to in the team, we will encourage them to either start with a compendium team or start with like intercession. Yeah, I think intercession is obviously one of the easier spots to start because the data sheets are simple and everyone just does their thing, but better. So it's easy to like visually grok. One it's of the things that's shockingly that I... cheap for it is very cheap. Too, yeah, yeah. Because I mean... every you can get assault intercessors for basically free, and you they can also those just out ask... like candy. People will also just give away like parts of their like old army, like old Marines that they don't want. They're like, yeah, just take them off my hand. I don't need all of these extra rando dorks. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I started playing with uh, Compendium Scions. I was running the old Metal Kasserkin. Then I switched over to Pathfinders. But then when I switched to Intercession, when they came out and ran them for, I don't know, half a dozen or so games, that for me is when the core rules really clicked. And a lot of the interactions between things like, you know, conceal, engage, obs obscuring, all of that kind of stuff really started to click with me. Um, and that's kind of like, I think if you can get to that point, then it's like, okay, now jumping back into the bespoke teams is a lot easier now because now you know all these core rules. Now you can focus on all the special rules, all the additional rules that the, the bespoke teams bring to the table. Yeah, I uh, definitely compendium teams are very straightforward. I ran compendium tau. Got to have those three cell suits, even though they're garbage. So um, bad. They're, they're so bad. So, they're so trash. Like for anyone who is struggling out there with compendium tau and trying to play cell suits, it's that's the problem. You can't play them no. as as cool as they are. They are just terrible three cell suits five breachers with the shotguns and then one gun drone that's all you need baby let's go <laughs> try it is, yeah. close visually, range tau cool or team. the best tau it, yeah visually it's a very cool team they're just not good just because those oh, cell suits are such a liability i think the only way that i've conceived of playing that team is stealth suits with pathfinders just because you get the most operatives and then you sack a stealth suit so you get two drones just to get your activation count up. And even then, that's not like you're not really playing stealth suits. You're just crippled by your two stealth suits. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you learn the game off of that. Uh, don't be like me and go like, oh, wow, Child Math is coming out. I'm going to play Pathfinders. Wait, Novitiates. They're the best. Yeah. Novitiates are and good. Then, they just they just then, won a big Australian tournament, a 44-man yeah. tournament that are 
did an article for Vagoon Hammer, so Novitiates have been good the whole time, pretty much. Outside time. Of- Their one small nerf was justified. Auto chastisers for that one equipment point, now now two, very justified. Yeah. Still very good. Um, got the best gotcha in the game still, and still very strong. And they've still got the best plasma gun in the game too. Hits on twos, rerolls ones, and basically can range. have just like full crits whenever you want. It, I will legion, say it, it. Nurgle every time. Le- Nurgle legionary dies every turn. Yeah, I've played into Adarian's uh, Novitiates more times than I care to. <laughs> I played those. Basically, until uh, what the second expansion of ITD. So I played a lot of games with the girls. Yeah. Uh, the second, the second team, the second box that came out, that was Higher Tech Circle, right? That's this week's niche tactics, right, Jason? Yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> niche tactics. Yes. So for today's niche tactics, we are going to be diving into Higher Tech Circle. Um, Higher Tech Circle is a gold mine of secret weapons and cool tech i feel like people have really only explored a couple of options but there is a lot there so let's jump in with some hyrotech circle niche tactics oh where to start with hyrotech circle because they are definitely one of the more complex teams that i've run maybe uh, other than phobos um and i would say i am not a big brain kill team player either i'm i would consider myself competent um so maybe some of these Thoughts are not surprises to some of the bigger brain folks out there, like maybe Shane, who's uh, who's picking them up and trying to run with them. Um, you know, I think most people tend to forget the magnification conduit with the Apprentic and the Cryptek. Um, and it kind of comes as a shock to people when it's like you're bouncing shots through the, each of them and then you're getting to pick all, all the all the dice of one type uh, to, to reroll. Um what people don't always think about is you can also overwatch through the magnification conduit because it's a shooting attack. Um, and that suddenly becomes, you know, oh, I didn't think you could fire your AP1 entropic lance at me. And nope, my apprentice can see you. I'm going to bounce my shot through you and overwatch you. And then I'm getting those rerolls too on an overwatch. Um, so I think that that's one of their strategies. Um, to kind of take look at them from a sort of 10,000 foot view, um, they're a 10 operative team that wants to act like an elite, but they don't have the APL of an elite. Um, so they can be kind of tough to use. And they're very much what I like to call sort of an order of operation team. Um, you want to maximize some of the ability. So the cryptic has command, which is a zero AP. He can be pseudo APL four or even APL five. If he drains the, uh, the, the, bu- the bugs or one of his other fellow higher tech circle models for an extra APL. Um, but you want to set it up so that you're activating your cryptic so you can maximize the use of the command. Um, and what, for those who don't know what command does it, it lets you either do an overwatch, a free fight or a, a one AP mission action. Um, so you can have a, a model move up onto an objective that, you know, you normally couldn't tap like loot and then you activate your crypt deck and now suddenly he can loot it for free. Um, the, the other thing that you kind of want to keep an eye on is the, the despotech has, has a demand that gives you basically a free command reroll. Um, and he can command him, he can demand himself or you can, uh, demand a model within six inches of him. um, they're very much because of that. They're very much our operation. You want to set up your combo so that you can chain not only your activations, but chain these little these little commands, these demands, all these other things that you're trying to do um, with the apprentic and bouncing shots. You want to set it up so your apprentic is in the right place. He's on an engage. He's not hopefully going to get his uh, ass shot off, and then you can activate your crypt deck and shoot. In some cases, you can actually get two shots technically out of the Apprentic because the Apprentic goes on engage, moves into his place, makes his own shot, and he's got an AP1 bolter doing 3-4, hitting on threes. Uh, and then you sh- then the next activation is your Cryptic shooting another shot through him and either taking out that operative or taking out another operative. Um, and amusingly, you could even do that if your Apprentic shot somebody, charged into somebody, he's still on engage, and then your Cryptic can shoot through the Apprentic. Definitely. You have a move into a position, because in Hyrotech, your Cryptic is the most important operative you have. Um, 
you can if that if that operative dies too early, that team can fall apart. So you keep them safe. You use your apprentice tech to basically be the eyes for your crypt tech. Put him in the position where you think you would want your crypt tech to shoot. Wait, hold uh, on. Are we saying that you charge the apprentice tech and then use him as a position to shoot from? Or is this like stand him out and shoot? <laughs> hold on. Are we, yes. what are, what, did I miss something here? I think he said the oh, uh, uh, a gaming term what he just meant move uh move aggressively forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that's what I heard Colorado Jason saying. I, but Jason, <laughs> Jason the co-host is thinking I'm going to charge my apprentice and then now I can use him as the starting point for a shot. I don't actually. Well, uh, that, we're going to have to hold on that one. <laughs> I so wish that worked that way. It does though. So. It, really? it actually does. It does work that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, the person that's actually shooting here is the Chronomancer, who is not engaged, but the person you're drawing line of sight from is, is the engaged and it, model. And it only cares about determining line of sight, not anything yeah, else about correct. select target. So, that's so, crazy. Just, just for anyone who doesn't realize, those are, you know, I know that Colorado, Jason, you were talking about charging into battle to shoot, because you talked about explicitly shooting your bolter first, but Jason... <laughs> Wants to remind everyone else that there is another play. Was there an actual FAQ for this, Jason? Okay, so I don't think it was an actual FAQ, but I've seen people play it this way. Um, there, like, if you actually go dive through the rules, it, this is how it is going to shake out. Like, I don't, I don't have the exact details, but I'm very confident that it works this way. I mean, I don't know. I could be wrong, so maybe it is still worth taking a peek, uh, seeing if it really does. Yes. Oh my God, you're gonna make me yes. do this and do this live. In the meantime, you know, I'm curious, Jason, <laughs> Jason, do you use recon or security as far as your strategic choices go? Because I when I was writing the article on Goonhammer, I know that for the majority of the life of higher tech discourse, it was all about recon play. I can go get recover item with a death mark. I can go hold this recover artifact and just sit around and gain points. But I have kind of come around to the idea of using your operatives a little bit more aggressively and just really relying on being back up on turn four to score security. Where do you fall on that discussion? While I look up this play. Yeah, de definitely. I think when I first started running higher tech uh, towards the end of last year, after they got buffed again, uh, I was definitely doing the recon game. Um, I was taking uh, uh, unearth artifice. I was taking recover item. And then depending on if I was running open or ITD, I was either running like secure vantage or secure unexplored rooms. Um, and it, it, it works, but I think it's tough because Necrons are slow, right? They only move four inches. So now you're having to commit yourself to uh, doing intractable march and then putting your uh, immortals on engage so that they can get their full six inch move to get up to that recover item. And a lot of times you can't get to recover item on turn one. Um, and, and that can kind of hurt because then that gives your opponent time to go over there and stand near it or kind of keep you away from it. And the problem with unearth artifice is you can't pick it up and move it. So wherever you put it, you have to basically castle around it, um, and then hold it. Uh, and I think unearth artifice actually plays better into security because with security, you can take, uh, seize ground. So you can put your unearth artifice near that seized ground. And so now you have operatives to hold that. And since uh, unearth artifice uh, also scores at the end of the game, as this does to seize ground, it's very synergistic uh, with one another. Um, I have been lately playing security with them now, uh, typically taking seize ground, secure center line, and either central control or the, the Farah tonic furnace control in beta decima, which is replaces central control um i haven't been running unearth artifice um but i think having played a couple games now with security with them you know i do see some synergy there and i want to try playing unearth artifice with the seize ground because you have to be standing near that objective anyway you might as well just put an easy two points next to it yeah and you know, if you're really waiting for turn four to do the majority of your scoring, having one turn miss on your get back up is actually not as big of a deal as when you're trying to play these early points where you have to go stand on objectives early, right? When you're missing out on recon recover item because you have to go stand out there early, losing that operative on turn two just might mean that you never get that uh, objective back on turns three and four. Yeah, that's that's totally right. And, you know, I when I played just kind of 
Pablo or Phobos really quick. When I play Phobos, I will play Recover Item. And my whole go- game plan with that item is to run out, grab it that first turn. You don't even need to pick it up, although I usually do pick it up. Um, and then the second turn is that operative that has it. I move him to a safe spot. So I know he's going to score that point on the second turn. And then I'm done with that tack op, right? With higher tech, it's harder to do that, right? Um, if you run up and you're out there, you've put an operative out there. And if he if he goes down, you're now betting on that three plus uh, reanimation. And that I think that is one of the things that makes the game so that yeah, makes the higher tech circle so swingy. You know, you may or may not get the operative back. I have there have been times where I've had an operative die turning point one and I did not make a single roll all game. and He just never came back. Yeah. So making sure that you can hedge your bets on when those things come back up, that's probably that does help mitigate some of the feels bad, because if your goal is to have a dominating position at the end of the game, it doesn't matter if you get up on turn two or turn three, as long as you get up by turn four. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think there is some play, too, with reanimation protocols to putting your guys out there early in the game and getting them shot and killed early in the game, because it does give them more chances of standing back up. And it's also if you can get your opponent to react to those first early pieces and you can return fire those guys, those guys that you kill, they stay dead forever. But you've now got three turns to get back up. So you're really abusing that arbitrage of uh, opportunity. Yeah, definitely. And and with the new the new buffs that with reanimation protocols, you're you're going to get up and you're not going to be injured. And so as long as that operative can stay alive, that's that's the key thing is you you because of the way initiative works in the game. Obviously, it's not a set thing. You roll dice and. Uh, you you want to have enough pressure so that that operative that just got up, a you can reset that token up within three inches of where the the operative went down, right? So you want to make sure that you can put him behind a barricade, behind a wall, someplace where you can put him up on a conceal. Um, and then you want to have some pressure so that that your opponent can't just shoot that operative that just got up with maybe six or seven wounds as an easy kill. You know, he's got some other operative maybe who's full health that he has to deal with that gives that that operative that just got up a chance to do something. Yeah. And, you know, just to circle back to that original question from the chaos, chaos legionary (laughs) Phobos player over here. I do think that it does work. You can charge an apprentic into someone and then use your apprentic eyeballs to shoot out of combat because there's nothing, nothing that stops that because in select valid targets. It talks about how you cannot shoot people that are in engagement range, but you are not, as long as you're not shooting the person in engagement range with your Apprentic, you are, I think you're free to go. Yeah, I've definitely put an order in at the shop to get the higher tech circle on the shelves, and I picked it up with the intent that if it doesn't sell in a week or two, I'll probably buy them just because I want to try them. Because after writing the Goonhammer Tacticon, and I do think that there's some layers of play that, you know, haven't really been talked about or are still waiting to be discovered. Whether or not the eight operatives really does feel like something that is approachable over a long period of time, not 100% sure. But the idea of having just very tough dudes that just need to get up by turn four, that seems doable. Whereas the recon stuff just does not seem to have panned out over a long period of time. Yeah, and in general, like I mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot still to solve with Hyrotech Circle, so listeners, join the Discord, join the conversation, and let us know your secrets as well. Yeah, definitely Hyrotech. Uh, they are a challenge to solve, and I have been working on them for a while, but like I said, I'm not a bra- big brain player. Um, uh, I'm going to have to try charging the Apprentech and shooting uh, uh, as a target that uh, he's not engaged with or is not engaged, because that seems like kind of a fun little uh tactic to do because now you're tying up another operative when you've charged him um so and you're getting that extra movement out of him so i don't know jason you your your thought process on itd bring the psychomancer you know the one that no one ever brings is very valid you destroyed four girls in like two shots with it with that yeah, yeah. i i have played with the psychomancer a little bit um i mean you know i think every, the 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 conventional wisdom right now is the chronomancer is basically the, the take all you know you bring them in pretty much in every matchup um because the chronometron and the uh, counter temporal nano mine those are the, and and then you just pick either entropic lance or aeon stave depending on if you want blast or if you want the the ap um but i do think that there's play for the psychomancer um especially on itd I mean, he's got a blast splash weapon rolling five dice. That's AP two. AP two. 
you know, it's only two, two, but it's blast splash one. Um, and lethal and on, fight plus an ITD. And so. yep, lethal fight plus an ITD. And he has some objective play because he can make it harder for people to run up on like loot or secure and tap that objective because now he requires you to take to use an extra AP to do that. Yeah, I mean, the Psychomancer, super cool model, super cool abilities, um, really unexplored in general, but there's there's a lot of good play there. Um, there's a friend of mine locally. His name is Ted. He's been playing the Psychomancer. He's been crushing it. And he is my hero. Uh, Psychomancer is a real champion. So, so since you're a Psychomancer champion, I think, you know, what powers do you like to see run? Because I think it's, it's the one, and I forget what they are off the top of my head. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's the, uh, Harbinger Despair, which is the one that lets you make the, the actions cost more within that token aura. Right. And it's a big enough that you can just drop it onto an objective. Um, and then I think the other one that I see play is conjure trauma where you can just pick an operative and say, no, you're injured. And most people tend to forget that it's not just minus one ballistic skill and weapon skill, but you lose two inches of movement when you're injured. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like those are uh, some of the standout powers. I'm not super familiar with the other ones. I just know that um, one of like Ted, who I mentioned earlier, uh, has been playing the Psychomancer and he has been really bringing some heat there. He did very well at the he did very well at your open, right? At the Renegade Open in November. Yes, uh, he did really well on day one. Unfortunately, he was not able to make it to day two. But um, yeah, there's a lot of cool tricks there. Psychomancer is awesome. Yeah, because on on in the dark, you can really think of the Psychomancer's gun as five attacks on threes, two, three, lethal five, AP two, because that's effectively what it works at. Because whenever you get a crit, you're getting the splash damage. Anyone getting caught in the blast is probably just going to help doink everyone else down. So any of those horde teams, especially because on in the dark, you effectively can do the four APL legionary play of opening two doors and looking at your opponent's back line. So if they're really not paying attention, you will just delete every a trivial amount, an arbitrary amount of seven moon models, which is big game. Well, you know, what? tell us a little bit about any upcoming tournaments out in the Colorado area, you know, before we split for the night. You know, we've talked a lot about Phobos, surprisingly enough, on a Hyrotech Circle Hearthkin episode. But what's coming up in Colorado? Tell our fans and hopefully any maybe Colorado listeners who don't know you guys. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we will, we're planning another tournament either uh, late March or early April, uh, probably after Rocky Mountain Open. Um, and this, this will coincide with the ending of our league. Um, this is probably going to be a 16 player tournament, but kind of as a Darian had alluded to earlier, we're probably gonna have to kick this up to 32 considering just how, uh, quickly the, the player base out here has, has expanded. Um, and then we've been talking with Tacticon Denver, uh, about running a two day 32 player kill team tournament in August at Tacticon. Um, so those are the two things right now, I think that we have on our calendar, uh, there'll probably be another smaller tournament or two, uh, in there. We just haven't planned them out yet. Exactly when they're going to land. I'm so afraid of that being forced to be a 64 at Tacticon because I don't have that much terrain right now. No, no, <laughs> neither do I. And I don't want to paint more terrain, especially this is where more this is where you have to do the, the clarion call to your entire player base to bring as much terrain as possible. I know that in New York, we can get up to like 40, 50 sets of like 40 or 50 players worth of terrain without having to do too much outside of New York. But, you know, you do got to put out the call. Yeah, I think we, we probably could get there with the players that are in the group because we do have a lot of sets. I mean, our what we've been using for terrain is basically what comes in the box sets. So, you know, Octarius, Chalneth, uh, Morak, Nakmud, um, that's what we've been using. Um, and we've been using the turning point tactics uh, layouts um, quite because it's basically accessible to everybody. Almost everybody has at least one of those boxes sitting somewhere if they're playing kill team. And it's just easy to say, use these layouts for your whatever terrain that you want to use. Um, but if we go to 64 players, we may have to look at uh, alternative layouts just to get to that table count. I'm going to have to buy more LVO terrain. I will say that Hodge hodgepodge terrain is totally fine as far as you know as long as everyone knows how all of the base rules work you really don't need specific terrain you just need enough terrain because new york that's our like big thing is we always play 
hodgepodge terrain. So like, you know, up coming up the week that this comes out, this podcast will be streaming the Bushwick Brawl, which will have at least one of the stream games be on kind of like a mix of terrain. So you'll see if you two are curious, you can see what New York does. And honestly, there's a there will be a access for you two for a link of every single board that New York has used basically over the last two and a half years and really you don't need the map packs but it is nice to have them in your back pocket if you really just want to let people play and not worry too much about the map balance but you can you don't need those things of course not but oh. it, it makes it just more accessible when you're like okay use your use your uh, octarius box this is how you set it up so it's caught it so it's it's fair play a fair game yeah. have fun with it yeah, and I'll say we turned to the the those map packs early on during when we planned the first tournament because we thought about making our own layouts and kind of testing our own layouts to make sure that they weren't like, you know, there wasn't a huge kill zone or something like that. Um and we found these map packs and we're like, great, one less one less thing we have to do because I think a lot of people don't always realize like how much effort goes into organizing a tournament. It's not just we pick a date and we're just going to, you know, throw some tables together and play some games. You have to, you know, set up how you're going to do all your scoring. You got to set up your, you know, if you're using like best coast pairings or how you're going to track everything. Um, and, and then there's like trophies and price support, uh, all, all kinds of things that you have to do. Um, and it was a lot of a lot of work to set it up. So, um, but yeah, the. The map packs, like Adarian says, have made it really accessible, and everybody in our uh, our play groups have said they really enjoy them. They like them. They're pretty decent. They're not without their faults, but um, compared to some of the layouts that people will make on their own or the layouts that you see in the books, um, they're definitely some of the better uh, competitive games that you know don't have like a huge kill zone or are completely lopsided, like like maps five and six of Beta Decima. Yeah, those ones probably need a little bit more time in the oven. And, you know, our 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 first and still remaining sponsor is, you know, Luster's Workshop that produces the LVO terrain. So if you are interested in getting a set, it is a little bit pricey, but it is there is a link that, you know, any support that you toss his way does help us out a little bit in the sense that he was our first sponsor. So. All right. Well, Jason and Adarian, thank you for coming on, talking about Colorado and showing us a little bit about your two front runner teams right now you know we got a lot of juice to squeeze and surprisingly a fair amount of phobos talk unsurprisingly i guess for any normal listeners of the podcast i don't think anyone would be surprised that we somehow talked about space marines for a fair chunk of this podcast i mean adari and i both play phobos it was inevitable that they were going to come up at least at some point in the conversation yeah 